I would like to invite uh, Dil Astyam, who will be presenting on the topic Enhancing Enterprise Agility Using the TOGAP and IT Pro Standards. Welcome, Dil. Uh, Dil Astyam is the president of Metaplexity Associates. He is actively involved in the development of TOGAP and RPG and has extensive training and consulting experience in enterprise architecture in Tokyo. He is the past chair of the Open Group Architecture Forum and is the chairman of Modeling and Terminology Committee in the forum. He has also served a two-year term on the Open Group Governing Board. Over to you, Phil. Thank you. Yeah, I came here uh, actually to Hyderabad a year ago and did a presentation that was very similar to this one. Um, but at that time, it was kind of a prototype. Since then, I've been joined by three other people. Um, so myself, but also Mike Fulton. Michael Fulton, some of you may know him. He has just previously been working with CCNC Solutions. And uh, just last week, he started a new job uh, an enterprise architect over at Nationwide Insurance, which is kind of back in his hometown in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, and then also Sylvain Marie from Paris Moore from Paris, France, and Lukas Rosinski from uh, the Architecture Center Limited, which is located in England, but uh, they're actually uh, a group of people that came from Poland originally. And uh, so right now we are all working together on a white paper that really talks about this subject in more detail. So I'm going to be giving you pretty much just some of the highlights of the things that we've been doing for the past uh, year as we work on this white paper. So before I got started with this project, I was the chairman of another project of the Open Group that's called Project Harmony. And we, we just finished a presentation talking about Archimate. Um, so when Archimate came out, it really was developed by a group of architects in the Netherlands. And um, Archimate was not designed to be like totally compatible with Togap. It was a separate product that had its own development stream, its own intellectual property. So when the two standards got into the market together, people were trying to use them, and they were finding that there were some places where there was disconnects. And so we said, gee, we need to figure out a way to harmonize Togap and Archimate. And so myself and about three or four other people, we basically worked uh, for about almost two years and came up with some very detailed analyses of uh, the differences between Archimate and Togal and then recommendations for how you can overcome some of those challenges. So, so that's Project Harmony. And so this week we're going to be talking here about kind of the differences between and the, and the similarities between TOGAF and IT for IT. So let me go ahead and get started here. So this, this page is a lot of text here, you don't have to read it. It's just talking about the white paper that we're working on. So I just uh, uh, basically told you everything you need to know. So we're going to start by just reviewing TOGAF. I've seen the elements of TOGAF up on the screen several times today, so I'll be brief. Uh, and then I'm going to introduce IT for IT. And that is probably something that's a little bit less well known to you, so I'll, I'll dig in there. But then I'm going to look at the touch points between the two. So what are the similarities, what are the differences that we see between TOGAF and IT for IT? And then how can we use them together to transform an enterprise's business capabilities, improve agility? And we'll talk about the, the kind of how can we get architecture to work better with communities that are practicing agile methods and DevOps and continuous development, some of these kind of modern day development methodologies. You know, I mean, this has always been going on. I remember, what, 10 years ago, everybody was head over heels about extreme programming. Uh, so we do have some fads that we go through. I, I'm a strong believer in the Gartner hype, hype curve. And so not everything is going to survive in the market. The extreme programming didn't. Uh, although there might still be some people that are doing it for special projects where they really need a you know, user interface design or something like that. But that's great. But for most people, other methods are okay. You know, today it seems to be in vogue to criticize waterfall models. And, well, I think when you're developing large-scale systems, waterfalls are actually what you really need. Uh, some of the stuff that you're trying to do with scrums are more like user-focused kind of things. How do we build applications for people? 
So when you're building back-end systems, um, sometimes you really need to be very methodological about your approach. So, so these are all trends and things that are going on inside of our industry, and they affect how we go about delivering value to the, to the enterprise. So let's just go ahead and take a quick look at TOGAF. So again, the Open Group Architecture Framework was the original meaning. Today it's just TOGAF. Today it's just a brand name that's trademarked by the Open Group. And uh, so it's a, it's a framework for doing architecture, especially enterprise architecture. And really helps us to focus on developing architectures that are based on standards as much as possible. You know, some companies care about standards. Other companies are less concerned about standards. And I think even they should be thinking about the consequences of you know, not really watching out for standards and the impact that they can have for you. So I'm hoping to get you to be able to build architectures that are more interoperable so your systems can talk to each other. And today with cloud computing and things like that, uh, portability is becoming more and more of a customer issue. So, so this is a, my adaptation of figure number one from TOGAF. I just took out a lot of text that was too small for you to read. But what it's really showing you on the left-hand side of the, of the screen, you see business, vision, drivers, basically strategic intent. And on the right-hand side, you see something called business capabilities. So TOGAF 9, one of its hallmarks, is this introduction to this idea of you know, capability-based planning, especially focused on business capabilities. So basically the idea is, is that as we go through the TOGAF method, we're going to basically identify strategic needs and then try and figure out capabilities that will address those needs. And as we address those capabilities, that will expose new opportunities for new strategic capabilities. So it's kind of a positive feedback loop. And the colored boxes you see in the middle are the major elements. There's six major parts of TOGAF. So you've got the architecture capability, which is where we manage and govern it. Uh, we've got the ADM, the, the crop circle diagram that everybody talks about, the, the development method. And then we've got the architecture content framework and the enterprise architecture repository and the enterprise continuum. And then finally, we have a set of reference models which are there for you to use if you wish. And then as you go through the TOGAF framework, up at the very top there you see this like one third there is the capability framework. And the middle tier is essentially the ADM and the, uh, the content framework. And then the bottom is the repository and the enterprise continuum. So, so that's actually figure number one in TOGAF, is the conceptual model. So what we're trying to do here with TOGAF is figure out how can we build capabilities that meet needs, and there were several speakers today that talked about this. So a capability could be something like, like uh, delivering products to customers on time or, or making sure that you can track shipments and things like that. In order to achieve that kind of a capability, you might have to take an incremental approach. So we talked about capability increments, so a little bit like transition architectures. And, and then we also talked about capability dimensions. So we can talk about the people, the process, the technology dimensions, and uh, so what we have to do to get our people ready to perform, how do we design a business process that works, and finally, what are the technology capabilities that we need to provide. So basically, this is my illustration. This isn't in TOGAP. This is kind of like my TOGAP game board, if you will. So the, the game of TOGAP is played by looking at all four of the domains up at the top there, business, uh, information, actually data, uh, applications and technology. The middle two, the data and applications are actually clustered together into what's called the information systems architecture. So we look at each of those domains, we basically perform this middle level thing here. We look at, for each of the domains, we look at the current state, the target state, and then the gap that exists between them. So what have I got to do to close that gap? Usually the gap in the enterprise architecture is significant enough that you're not going to be able to close it in one jump. And so we build in these transition architectures that incrementally help us move towards the target state. The blue arrows that you see around the target state represent the impact of the, of the uh, targets. So if we actually build this thing, what is the impact going to be? And then finally down at the very bottom, you know, everything in the TOGAF framework and the ADM is driven by requirements and constraints. 
Okay. So there's our beloved crop circle diagram. And, um, and you'll see me going through the ADM, so if you're not familiar with it already, uh, as I get further into this discussion, uh, you'll see me breaking the ADM down and explaining different parts and how they work with IT for IT. So, but basically, the top circle is where we start up an enterprise architecture practice. It's the, what we call the preliminary phase. And then once we complete that activity, then we can begin actually doing ADM cycles as projects, if you will. And those projects basically create a vision. They then flesh that vision out into an architecture description. And then they, they basically derive a solution architecture. And then they build a solution. And so that's the basic process. And you notice in the very middle there, you've got requirements management, which is driving the whole process. So then we talk about this architecture capability. And it's a little bit hard to read, but on the left-hand side, we've got the architecture staff. In the middle, we've got the project management and the implementation teams who are working on architecture contracts to develop something for us. And then on the right-hand side, you've got your, um, your, basically your operations people. And so this is kind of the flow of things, although we'd like to see this actually recirculating so that the operations people can talk to the architects. And, and then you'll notice at the very top there, the whole thing is governed by a network of governance structures like IT governance, uh, architecture governance, and in some cases even corporate governance. So then we have the enterprise repository. Um, again, you may not have a repository like this. I heard somebody asking a question earlier today that, uh, about you know, where do we store all of our Archimedes files. Well, in TOGAP, we have this thing that was recommended uh, to basically provide a container where you can store and organize your content. And I'm not gonna go into a big long explanation of this, but um, it basically has a place called the landscape. And that landscape can contain your architecture building blocks that are being used. And they're stored at different levels of detail, starting at a strategic level, going down to segment levels, and then finally getting to uh, your basically capability architectures. So, and then there's also a in the outer part of the gray box, you'll see a requirements repository and something that they call the solutions repository, which actually can be a, a variety of different things, like a, maybe a CMDB, configuration management database, or something like that, where you're actually storing operational system descriptions and things like that. And then there's this strange thing called the enterprise continuum, which befuddles a lot of people. They don't really understand what exactly this enterprise continuum is. Prior to TOGAF 9, the enterprise continuum was actually the recommendation for the architecture repository. So it was the place where we stored our content. And the reason they call it a continuum is you kind of view the building blocks that you put into that continuum on this kind of a number line that goes from the left-hand side, which is where you have very generic building blocks towards the right-hand side where you get increasingly more specific. Okay. So you finally get to the point when you get all the way to the right-hand side there where you have a specific uh, architecture, and then you get down to the green box there, the solutions continuum, you pretty much do the same thing. You might start out with a generic uh, piece of software, for example, SAP or something like that, but then you tailor it, configure it, until you finally get to the exact solution that the customer wants. So that's basically the, uh, the flow. And then we have something called deployed solutions down at the bottom. And that would be the stuff that's actually operational in the enterprise right now. So, so that's the enterprise continuum. So that's a review of the TOGAP standard. Let's go ahead now and take a look at this IT for IT. It's kind of the new kid on the block. It's a, it's a very exciting framework. And uh, how many people have seen this picture? How many people have not seen this picture? Let me see that. Okay, so there's a few people out there, okay. So some of you may remember Michael Porter's uh, famous book about competition, and uh, he talked in that book about value chains. So this is not exactly Michael Porter's version of the value chain. He had something quite different. This is an IT value chain, but it's kind of showing you the same thing, is that you know the goal here is to provide IT services to meet the needs of the business. And so we talk about having efficiency and agility is kind of the goals here. And along the way, 
On the top of this model, you see the four blue herringbone uh, wedges there. Those are basically the value streams, and you have, um, excuse me, plan, build, deliver, run, roughly. So that's sort of like the Deming cycle. And then underneath that, you see some uh, supporting resources. And uh, these are still being defined as they go through uh, the next version of uh, IT for IT. But the top part is pretty well fleshed out right now, and that's what we're going to focus on today. But I'm kind of excited to see what happens in the next version when they start fleshing out some of the stuff that's in the, the lower part as well. And these things are not just developed all at once. So as we go through, uh, we basically have a service life cycle. So we're trying to provide services to the enterprise. So we start out with strategy to portfolio. That's the plan thing that we were looking at just a minute ago. And so the strategy to portfolio is really where we start looking at what is it we're trying to do, that strategic intent that I talked about. And we start figuring out how to map that into an architecture. And so then as we do that, we basically come up with, you know, what is it we're going to do, strategy. Then we start moving into requirement to deploy. And this is where we start to think about, well, if I'm going to build this thing for the strategy, what have I got to do to fulfill that? Okay, so what's the requirements to deploy? And then, once we get the system up and running, it moves into request to fulfill, and that's where the system is actually operating. And so the customer says, I need 10,000 light bulbs or something like that, and we fulfill their order and we ship it to them, and, and uh, that's how it goes. And, and finally, excuse me, I skipped one there. At the very end, we have a thing called detect to correct. So uh, that's where we look for problems that might be happening and try and put it into an adaptive feedback loop so we can correct any issues, things like that. And uh, so as we move along this process, we're successively refining it, kind of like the enterprise continuum, we're kind of doing that same thing, except this is more about operational systems. This is not about, this is not about architecture. So now this one I don't expect you to be able to read. Um, it's a very detailed model, and it basically is what we call the level one reference architecture. And um, I've been misspelling it there. It says ITI for IT. We got to get that out of there. But um, if you look carefully, um, let me see here if I can point to things. The left hand side, the, the first column, is essentially strategy to portfolio. Okay, so that's all the strategic planning stuff. The next two columns are requirements to deploy, and pretty much the next three columns are request to fulfill, and then finally the last two columns are detected correct. Okay, so that's level one. Uh, the, the IT for IT standard right now uh, defines a total of five different levels, and they get more detailed as you go down, but they only publicly show you the top three levels. The bottom two levels are reserved for particular vendors to do like, like for example, maybe BMC might do the way that you know, they do the service management differently from Hewlett Packard or something like that. So each vendor can kind of define the internals of their solutions uh, using uh, levels four and five. So they don't talk about that specifically in the standard. Here's another way of looking at things. This is the service model. And basically, as we basically provide services to the customer to address issues, we can start out looking at kind of the um, conceptual level, where we can, we can look at continuous, uh, can't read that there, continuous assessment. So we're kind of constantly looking for things that need to be fixed. And then continuous integration for the logical level and continuous, um, continuous delivery for the actual uh, uh, solution that you're actually building. So that's just kind of talking about how we can go about delivering these services to customers. So the question becomes, can and should IT for IT uh, be used together? And I think there's a bunch of different attitudes and beliefs about that. Um, I think uh, some people in the IT for IT community are operations management people, and they don't understand why the architects would want to have anything to do with this. And uh, there's architects out there that say, well, I don't want to get my hands dirty with operations management. So 
I think we got some polarization along the way. Uh, but I think a lot of people realize that these two things actually can work together very well. And that's what we'll spend the rest of the presentation here. So when we try and do harmonization activities, the goal is not to like join IT for IT and TOGAF together so that they're inseparable. We want to keep them as independent standards, but we want to try and identify, you know, what are the ways that we can use them together? What are the exceptions? There might be some areas where you really shouldn't try and mix them together. So that's what this white paper we're working on is going to be producing. So we'll just give you a few ideas here. They are very complementary in many respects. Uh, there are areas where there are differences, and we'll talk about that. But there are significant benefits that could accrue from getting them to work together. So let's just take a look at this. So what are the touch points? So, you know, when we did the Project Harmony stuff with Archimate, uh, I remember one of my colleagues, Sonia Gonzalez, who's now the chairman of the, or the director of the Architecture Forum, she kept saying, Bill, TOGAF is a framework and Archimate is a modeling language. So there, there's differences there. So we repeatedly brought that up, which was pretty obvious. Uh, but TOGAF is an architecture framework. IT for IT is best referred to as a reference architecture for the IT function. Okay? Um, so where TOGAP is very gen general, IT for IT is more specifically focused on a particular thing. The scope of IT for IT is the business of IT. And it's basically providing you an operating model based on those value streams that I just talked about. And then defining information systems architectures that enable the interoperability across the business. So, you know, just imagine if you could get Detect to Correct to be able to you know, communicate back to the people that are working in the requirements uh, area, things like that. They you know, have better communication and fix problems sooner. TOGAP, on the other hand, is an architecture framework. The scope of TOGAP is really enterprise-wide and in some cases beyond. And it looks at those four domains, business, information, applications, and technology, and trying to define the business capabilities. So basically, conceptual models, they do have different conceptual models, no doubt about it. Uh, there are definitely some differences in the entities. You know, TOGAP talks about, for example, actors, organizations, um, services, talks about functions and processes, it talks about data objects, it talks about application objects and platform services and things like that. So those are the kind of entities that TOGAP is accustomed to modeling, whereas IT for IT is a much more specific set of, uh, of entities, which we'll look at as we go through here. So, so this is a, a thing that um, is called the meta model. Uh, this is a subject of great debate and discussion within the open within the architecture forum. Uh, we are trying to re-engineer this for the next version of TOGAF, and uh, we've really been coming up with a lot of different permutations of the model. And uh, but this one's a nice great starting point, and it just shows you the entities and their relationships to each other. You know, for example, actors are allowed to be part of an organization, and organizations are allowed to have functions and processes. So as long as there's a line that connects these different entities together, then that's a legal relationship that can exist. Okay? So I don't want to get lost in the metal model right now. I could do a whole hour on the metal model, and that's not what we're here to talk about today. Uh, then here we see the reference models for IT for IT. And again, like I mentioned, level one, two, and three, the standard explicitly talks about what's in each of those levels. But once you get below level three, it's reserved for the vendors to do their magic. So how do we use TOGAP and IT to transform uh, business capabilities? So here's the crop circle diagram. Preliminary phase up at the very top there, that's just setting up the architecture. So let's just say that's done. When we get to that next level down, that, that top circle in the crop circle diagram, uh, it says A, architecture vision. That's the normal starting point for an architecture project. And the goal there is to come up with a high level architecture vision for something we're trying to do. You know, maybe we're trying to build an ERP system that uh, can basically uh, manufacture widgets and keep track of hours for the workers in the factory and things like that. So we might start out with that vision of what we want. And then 
we can go into phases B, C, and D, and we can define the architectures, the actual high-level architectures for that. So we might say that we need uh, some poor ERP system, and we might say that we need uh, a module that can keep track of time, and we need another module that can do uh, uh, economic, economic order quantity calculations, things like that. So we can build the different elements that need to be put in. Notice here I'm not really talking about a product like SAP or Oracle or something like that. I'm just talking about the functional needs that we have. So typically phases B, C, and D, we try and operate at a logical level. Stay away from vendor products. Nothing wrong with vendor products. It's just that at this point in the game, we're trying to strip away that marketing and focus on what we actually need. What are the requirements that we have? And then we get down to the very bottom and we get to phases E and F. And that's where we bring the vendors in and say, okay, here's what we've identified as our needs. And then what is the, um, what is the products that we need, the vendor products that will fulfill, or what are the stuff that we might build? We might actually develop our own solutions or integrate existing solutions. So those are all things that you can, can do. And, um, and then as we move up there, by the time we get to phase G, we take the architecture, the solution architecture that we've identified, and we basically give it to the implementation organization, the development team, and they go off and develop it on their own, and this could be where the agile uh, work begins. Although the agile people would say, hey, we want to be more involved at the very front of this activity, and I don't blame them, but let's just say that the agile people would take over and finish whatever was started earlier. And uh, but then they will go ahead and actually build something that will solve the architecture, and then it rolls through the QA and test and rolls into production, and that's when it enters phase H. When the architecture actually rolls into production, we put it under change control in phase H and observe the architecture as it operates to make sure that it's fit for purpose. And if it is, we say, that's great, we're done. Uh, if it isn't, if it needs to be adjusted, we can do various things to adjust the architecture. So. So those are all the kind of things that we do in, um, in uh, TOGAF. And if you look at the balloons that are on the outside there, you can see how they've labeled those things using IT for IT terminology. And so we're going to see more slides like this, so I'm not going to dwell on this one. Here's another picture of the same thing. Uh, we see the ADM, and as we go through the first three phases, we're basically dealing with the uh, business services and things. And then as we get into the, the third phase, the information systems architecture, we're dealing with IT services that need to be provided. And then phase D kind of focuses on infrastructure services. <coughs> then we get into phase E and F, we're doing the solution roadmap and the implementation migration strategy. And then by the time we get into phase F, we're starting to package things up into projects that can be uh, implemented using work packages and delivery vehicles. And then basically phase G, we turn it over to the development organization. So, so that's one possible way of doing this. The other thing that's important to realize is this is showing TOGAF as kind of a deterministic waterfall. And it's really not. You can certainly do it as a deterministic waterfall if that's appropriate. But you can also, especially in TOGAF 9, you have the ability to iterate and do things in different sequences. There's no problem with that. So you could do, for example, phase B and phase C simultaneously if you wanted to, things like that. There's all kinds of little tricks that you can use to speed up development or get to the answers better. And here they're looking at the value stream. So again, on the left or the right hand side you see strategy to portfolio. And that definitely is a place where the, the right hand side of the crop circle diagram fits. And then you look at requirements to deploy, that's your solution architecture. Uh, request to fulfill is where you're actually building it and operating it, and then you put it under change control for detect to correct. So it's not a perfect mapping there, but it's it's not bad. And here you see some more of the stuff. Now here, um, up to the very top there, you see that red box that's um, highlighted. In strategy to portfolio, the very top box there is called the enterprise architecture component. And so the IT for IT group, when they were developing a standard, they really thought that enterprise architecture should be prominently featured. Um, and so it's right there at the very top of strategy portfolio. But I hope you've seen, as I've gone through this today, 
that there's other touch points to the ADM and to TOGAF, so it's not only that architecture component. Yeah, so here's the IT for IT perspective. When you talk to some of the people in that group, you know, this is kind of their major thing that they want to see TOGAF helping with is that enterprise architecture component. But I think we've seen that there certainly are some other things that we need to be, we need to get some things from the IT for IT people feed the stuff that we're trying to do as well. So this is kind of a concept that I'd like to leave you with. Last year I had a, a word up on here in Hindi that said harmony. And that seemed to get a lot of uh, cheers from the audience. Uh, but what I'm proposing here, I mean, everybody today is talking about DevOps. DevOps and continuous delivery, continuous integration, agile. Um, but I think you have to really have somebody who's watching the bigger picture. And so I think this is where the enterprise architects can really earn their keep. And so I'd like to see a way to make architecture and the development people and the operations people work together. That's really the, the big idea here. And um, yeah, there it is right there. I made it. Okay. So harmony. We can make that happen. So there was a, somebody showed this slide earlier today, and it's a little different configuration, but I really like this slide. Um, and this is out of Togap. I've kind of uh, embellished it a little bit. So on the left-hand side there, you see strategic planning. Okay. And there we have the. So this might be executives of the company, other strategic planning people. And they might be the ones that actually identify the capabilities. And they might be the ones that break down the increments and things like that. Uh, and then the architects will take over and they might do more of that capability planning, more of the building block design and things like that. And then it gets handed, and this is all very sequential, it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, the development team gets involved and then ultimately the operations people. So I came from manufacturing and you know, back in the old days, in the 1970s, when they designed automobiles, it would take them seven years to work an automobile from the loft all the way through the assembly line, rolling out the door. Uh, and they did a thing called concurrent engineering, where they started having the manufacturing, the design engineers, and the service engineers working together throughout the whole process. And they've driven the cycle time, cycle time down to a year or two now for developing a new automobile. So I think we have the same kind of an opportunity here if we can get the planners and the developers and the operations people to talk to each other you know, in the same similar way. So that's it. That's Toyaf and IT to transform the IT capability. And uh, yeah, here they're just illustrating some other things here uh, from that figure number one in Toyaf. I've really already said that. Here's the enterprise continuum. Again, as we move from left to right at the top there, you see what we call our uh, building blocks, the architecture building blocks, starting out at a very high level reference model and working all the way down to specific architectures. But again, these are vendor neutral, logical building blocks. And then the lower level is the solutions continuum, where we start out with maybe generic product descriptions or things that we need to build. And then we work that through the process until we wind up with a specific architecture that can be built. So that's just, and then here they're just showing you some of the, some of the goodies in the repository and how they could be used by the IT for IT community. And again, here they're using the ABM to implement IT for IT. And again, we've already really covered a lot of this stuff already, so I'm not going to go through it again. So that's it. I guess I kind of messed up there. Can you bring up my summary? Yeah, so just to sum up here, the TOGAP is a standard for doing architecture. The IT for IT is a reference architecture that really helps us to design the business of IT. So how do we properly execute IT that supports the, the business needs? So the two standards have many of the same goals, but different ways of doing things. And I believe, and be working hard to finish up this white paper that the two can be used together and if they do then I think it will be a beneficial thing to the enterprise. So ensuring that TOGAP and IT, IT for IT standard are properly harmonized will make each of them more valuable to the organization's employment. So that's my 